All right. Well, while we are waiting for folks to join, uh, it's going to be October at the end of the week. Who has a good Halloween costume? Becca, what about you? Honestly, I'm just excited that Halloween actually is going to happen this year. So I've yet to decide on what my costume will be. But uh, I did recently get a new cat. Um, I adopted a cat. So I'm thinking to Aww. maybe do something cheeky and cute with him. But we'll see. <laughs> nice. I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Veronica, I hear, I hear you have won costume contests. Yeah, we have, so we have, okay, I just have to say, we have a pretty boring tradition where we use the same costume for the last, I don't know, eight, nine years, and um, essentially my husband show up to some contest as a uh, Willy Wonka and the golden ticket, so he'll have the whole um, Willy Wonka gear, and I'll dress up in, like, this gold sort of disco dancing outfit with embellishments like of gold all over the place that is an amazing costume stacy what are you going as for halloween <laughs> well i have used the same halloween costume since college it is a, a pumpkin it's very large you can eat a lot of candy and it doesn't show so <laughs> i'll have to dig that out from somewhere i didn't use it last year <laughs> nice Nice. Wonderful. Well, um, I think we are good to go ahead and get started. I'm excited to kick off this conversation with everyone. Uh, first thing is first, this event is hosted by the team at Modern CS Pros, uh, as well as Modern Sales Pros. For those of you who are not familiar, Modern CS Pros is a sister community to Modern Sales Pros. Modern CS is focused, of course, on customer success, on the customer success community, uh, while MSP is the world's largest revenue leadership community for those in sales management, sales and revenue operations, sales development, and all of the related supporting disciplines. Uh, the mission for both communities, oops, on the same slide. The mission for both communities is to create environments for members to answer questions they would struggle to solve on their own um, and help them kind of see around corners that they may not know about. And we do that through great live sessions like what you're about to experience today uh, through our robust online forum and uh, in the near future uh, in in-person events again. So uh, those of you who aren't members will be invited to join afterwards, and we sure hope that you will. Um, if you like this content, you will love the Revenue Excellence Summit happening October 12th through 14th, where we will talk about the people, processes, and technology needed to help get you ready for 2022. Uh, but enough about MCS and MSP. Today's session would not be possible without the team at Catalyst, who are our sponsors for today. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Stacey Schmitz to say a few words about Catalyst. Stacey. Yeah. So Catalyst is a customer success platform. Um, our focus is really helping bring teams, specifically customer success teams, to the center of the organization. So think of this as a tool for CSMs to be able to manage their customers, manage onboarding, drive product adoption, and really have a, a central location to be able to see all of that information. So moving from multiple tools into one tools to be kind of the, the best CSM that you can be. Awesome. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you, Catalyst, for sponsoring today. Uh, so today we are talking about sales to CS handoff strategies that actually work. And we have some great experts in the field here to talk through the content. Um, so Stacy, Becca, and Veronica, before we get started, I would love for you to introduce yourselves, um, tell us a little bit about your background and experience in sales to CS handoffs, um, I will go first. I am Karen Rohr. I am going to be the moderator for today's event. Um, and I run the customer experience organization and sales strategy for Atrium. Uh, Stacey. 
Hey everyone, I'm Stacey Schmitz. I'm an enterprise account executive at Catalyst. I've been here about a little over a year and a half. I was one of the first members of the sales team and with that have really worked very closely with our customer success team and now our newly formed implementation team to build out our uh, sales to CS handoff. So I'll definitely share more about what that process looks like uh, in the panel today. Hey, I'm Becca Schaefer. I'm uh, the Director of Solutions Engineering here at Level Jump. I help out on both the pre-sale side for the business as well as post-sale side and working with our customers. Uh, pre prior to that, I was the first customer success manager at Level Jump. So this conversation is really exciting as the role I'm now in really bridges the gap between um, pre-sales and post. And hello, everyone. My name is Veronica O'Keefe. Uh, I work for a cybersecurity company called Red Canary. Uh, we're based in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I've been with this startup for about who, two and a half years. So when I started, we had two CSMs. Um, once my cohort joined our team, we were five. We were the five CSM team across uh, hundreds of customers. And um, since then, we've grown to about uh, 25, 26 uh, CS, CSMs and um, a fairly significant like sales organize, organization. So it's been super valuable. And I've had a lot of uh, learnings and takeaways um, as our organization continues to mature and grow. So I'm so excited to um, share some of those insights with uh, everyone on this call. And um, I manage our uh, CS team. Wonderful. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, first, this event is being recorded. So uh, for all of the attendees, you'll be able to access the recording and key takeaways on the previous events page of the MSP website. Uh, second, if you have a question for our panelists, please use the Q&A function and we will get to as many as possible of those um, as we can during the event. And so today, you know, we were gonna be covering sales to CS handoff strategies that actually work and take a deep dive into when and how should that sales to CS handoff take place? What information is critical to include in the handoff? Um, what are some common handoff challenges you've seen? And if you have any good fixes for those, obviously we would love to hear those as well. Um, and then we will wrap up with when and how you should engage technology to streamline the process. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen so that, oh, that was the housekeeping, uh, so that you can see our wonderful panelists. Um, and we are going to get started. So our first question um, is the, the when and how question. So when and how should that sales to CS handoff take place? Um, Stacy, why don't you kick us off? Um, how do you think about that at Catalyst? Yeah, so the way that we think about it at Catalyst in terms of the when is a little bit of a, it depends. So the way that we have set it up is for SMB and mid-market customers, AEs are completing the handoff uh, template, which I can get into uh, a little bit later, uh, the, when the deal closes. For enterprise and strategic customers, the expectation is that AEs are filling that out uh, at least a few weeks before the, the deal closes. Um, how it's taking place, I think that's something that we've really come a long way at, at Catalyst. Um, we have a, a template that we fill out and that's really removed the need to have a sales to CS handoff meeting for folks who have uh, kind of for implementation managers who have left their, their ramp period. So we still have those meetings for new folks because it's a time to get to really kind of dig into the details, but it's been a huge time saver, I think, for everyone involved to be able to have clarity around when am I supposed to complete this? What am I supposed to share to the point where all of the information an implementation manager needs to go off and running is prepackaged and, and ready to go. So we don't have to, I think, add another thing to either the AE or the implementation manager's plate once the, the deal closes. 
Yeah, and if you're targeting that kind of few weeks lead time, does that mean that those implementation managers, how are they looking to see what is being assigned to them, what's going to be assigned to them? Yeah, so we use Catalyst for that internally. Our The manager of the implementation team has a dashboard in Catalyst where they have visibility into all of the opportunities that are closing within the next 30 days or are in stage two, so kind of halfway through the stage process. At that point is when an implementation manager is being assigned. So within that dashboard, Kyle, the the manager on that team can really load balance to say, okay, let's make sure that we're not putting too many strategic accounts on one implementation manager's plate. Um, And then that's that's also really helpful from an AE perspective because it means I know if I do need help from a, a question or a scoping point of view, I know exactly who I can reach out to pretty early on in the deal. And that's definitely a newer process that we've we've built out at Catalyst. And I think uh, as a seller, I've definitely felt the impact of just having clarity of who should I speak with? When should I be sharing this information? I think it also helps a little bit when you know it's going to a specific person on your team as a seller. I personally feel a little bit more care and responsibility in terms of, I know who this is going to, like, I want to hand this off to, like, I know it's going to Sarah. Like I want to give her what she needs to be set up for success Versus sometimes if you know, it's just going around Robin going off into the abyss. It's like, "Mm, I'm not sure where this is going. I'm not sure how much due diligence I need to do here. Um, I think a small thing, but that's definitely helped there. So the dashboarding catalyst is what keeps us honest in terms of when those should be completed and, and handed over. Yeah. Becca, how do you handle this at level jump? Yeah. Great question. Uh, So we are heavy Salesforce users here and we, recently brought in Catalyst over a year ago. So for us, the when and the how is actually tied together and it's always based on the data and how do we streamline this process to one, get rid of the need for the meeting, two, for sales, the amount of time, time they spend understanding the prospect's needs that shouldn't need to be repeated to the new customer success manager on there since they're already filling that out. So the way we do it here is the handoffs actually starts based on the current sales stage of the intended close date. So we have the expected close date and then what we're actually intending. And that report is gets triggered and then there's an expected CSM that's allocated to that account. And once that, once that prospect enters that certain stage, there's information that they have to pop, put in to that opportunity that's already gearing the CSM up for what they should be expecting for when that deal actually closes. And then with that info that the sales rep is already bringing, putting into Salesforce, which aligns with our SLA of what the CSM expects from when this deal is to close sales. This is all pre-populated into a catalyst template. So sales doesn't need to redo the work that they've already discovered and uncovered from the prospect. And that's seamlessly moved over to our CSM team based on stage with all that information feeded in. Yeah, and one of the questions that just came up in the Q&A is about how do we avoid the sales reps doing double work? Becca, it sounds like for you, it's by having them make sure they're inputting values in Salesforce where they are already, and then that's populating in Catalyst, is that right? Correct. Correct. So if we know that they're about to hit stage four and a contract's going out, we should already know what their key outcomes are, define deadlines and targets for launches, and all of that will just be fed into Catalyst. So it's all there and they actually can't move the stage of the opportunity unless that information is filled in. Awesome. And so making sure they can't move the opportunity is how you kind of hold them accountable to make sure that's getting filled out. Exactly. And it helps them on that side with sales forecasting. And then it helps the CSM, especially what, like back to what Stacy's point was, not putting too many strat accounts on one person as opposed to others. So it really allows us to streamline it and ensure that our sales forecasting is accurate for the CSMs and no data needs to be duplicated and all that information is there and ready to go. That in case some a close date is moved up sooner, There's not a rush and a scurry in a hurry because all the information is already there based on those values having to be entered into Salesforce, which then in turn get populated into that catalyst template. Awesome. 
Uh, Veronica, how does Red Canary handle this? When and how does the handoff process work? Yeah, in, in a similar fashion to both Stacy and Becca, we have, we're a heavy like Salesforce user. Um, there are different triggers and automations in place once the, the particular stage of a deal is hit so that both the um, CS team and the sales team are in alignment with, you know, okay, by the time this, uh, by the time this customer signs this deal, they'll have an assigned CSM incident handler and technical account manager. So those lines of communication are um, fairly clear with the different automation playbooks that we have in place. And we're sharing that like common um, thread of like knowledge regarding the customer account. Um, but what I wanted to share, like if we were to take a step back a little and um, what I've seen across different SaaS organizations and what's been like led to successful outcomes for the sales to CS handoff. Um, I've seen like three sort of high level themes, you know, outside of the applications being used in the procedural logistical um, components. And those three themes are essentially timeliness and um, knowledge share and I bucket together communication and collaboration. Um, I think when your organization is thoughtful about these um, high level like concepts, those procedural steps and um, you know the general execution of the sales to CS um, handoff just like naturally like is successful. Um, and I know like throughout the course of this call, we'll go over uh, some of those uh, specifics. Yeah, yeah. We, um, in a second, we'll shift over to kind of what info is included. I know that's one of the, the questions in the Q&A. Um, there's a question about how you hold sales reps accountable for filling out the kind of handoff notes that will be helpful. For Becca, she said level jump, it's required fields in Salesforce. Do you do something similar at Red Canary? Yes, um, we have very clear lines for roles and responsibilities per AE and CSM. So it's sort of, um, like that natural like expectation that um, this, like we have the shared checklist document that the CS, uh, CSM owns post sales during that initial like handoff where um, that alignment like happens and um, there's that disclosure of like information between both stakeholders. Awesome. And a related question to this that came up is, um, how do you ensure quality information is populated, not just kind of minimum info required to get it past the gate? Um, Veronica, if you want to tell us how Red Canary handles that, and then uh, Stacy or Becca, if you want to uh, jump in with how you approach this as well. Yeah, yeah, no, so that is a great question. And, um, you know, you want to be very thoughtful in the beginning around what those transition like questions and those data fields are. Um, currently at you know Red Canary, we have a, an awesome like dedicated RevOps CS operations enablement um, teams. But previous to that, it, we were just a five person team. So um, a lot of those conversations and like creating this documentation and really focusing on those important elements came to those in the field and leadership really like spending that time together to qualify what those what that information is. And when organizations can um, really think through that entire like process, it really makes it for like more of a flawless transition later. Yeah. Um, Stacy, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think as the 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 seller in the room who's the one being expected <laughs> to hand over the quality information, I think Veronica's point is spot on. Like having leadership buy-in that goes all the way down to every individual contributor, what is the information we're sharing and why? making sure that if I think of what I'm having to put into Salesforce at every stage, yes, I'll admit, sometimes when I open it up, I just write things so I can quickly move on with my day, but that shows up in the Monday pipeline meeting. So if it's very clear that there's a trend of like, oh, Stacy's writing the same one line use case over and over, that very quickly becomes apparent. And then if I think of taking that all the way through to the actual handoff process, we the, the template that we use in Catalyst pulls directly from Salesforce when we um, fill that out, it gets pushed to Slack automatically in a channel that everyone at the, the company can have eyes on. That puts a lot of visibility and you can really quickly see like who's 
like writing stuff that matters and who's writing garbage. And also that lives for perpetuity on the account uh, in Catalyst as well. So I think this idea of all being aligned in terms of what is important and why am I providing that information, giving AEs and CSMs the ability to give their two cents as well. Like, do I think that that will be helpful? Is that easy information for me to capture? And then just continuing to have that kind of like visibility and accountability into that data as you go. I think if I think of past roles where I've I've seen handoff templates where it's just full of these questions. And if I know you're not going to do anything with that data, if I know it's going into a Google drive and no one's going to look at it ever again, I can almost guarantee you, I'm not going to put much time into that because you're not going to put much time. Like the CS team isn't going to get any value out of it anyways, or it's going to die in a Google drive, who knows where. Yeah. yeah and, and I would, then, oh, sorry, go ahead. Becca. No, 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 I was actually just going to jump in Stacy from that seller's perspective and Veronica from the CS perspective. The way, the reason why we do it this way, so as me being really that bridge in between is we don't require certain info being filled out in early stages of the opportunity because we respect our sellers time and we don't want them being bogged down in information as they're continuing doing discoveries and demos and deeper dives with the prospect priorities and things may change. So we only make certain fields required when it hits a certain stage in our sales cycle. So the sellers are happy with that because it's there, they have a more defined understanding of really what, what, why the prospect is buying and the problem that you're trying to solve. So what the CSMs ask them to fill out in that later stage on the opportunity directly relates back to what is going to be focused and the kickoff call and the deadlines and things that they're expected to hit. So we really, we only put in pertinent information that's going to help the CSMs to not bug the seller once it closes and also not bog down the seller filling in information for an opportunity that may not end up closing and wasting their time. So it's really about finding that middle balance. And for us, it was when it landed in a certain sales stage. Awesome. Um, we have one more question from the QA I want to get in, and then we're going to shift to our next topic. And that is, a few of you have mentioned kind of you know, Stacey, you mentioned as the seller, knowing who that implementation manager is going to be kind of puts a little bit more accountability on you that there's a, a person receiving that data. Um, how does the the kind of implementation manager or CSM uh, assignment work? Is there auto assignment? Is there a person on team who's doing that assignment? How does that process work? So at Catalyst today, it's a it's a manual process given the, the size and stage of a company that we're at that's still very much doable. Our implementation managers have not been segmented out um, at this point. So that happens manually. Um, the manager of that team, as I mentioned, has that dashboard. It's He has like a the ability to see which new customers or prospects have fallen into that view. He goes through within the dashboard, you can literally add it in line, and then it automatically like updates the flow. The implementation manager sees it in there their book of business. So today it's manual, but um, I've personally spoken with quite a few CS teams who have built out logic in Salesforce that's kind of doing that, that auto assignment, which I know is um, something teams can do as well. Yeah. Um, Veronica or Becca, do either of you have auto assignment? We don't have auto assignment, but we do have auto notification, right? So we have a segmentation with um, our SMB mid-market and enterprise customers. So with our enterprise customers, you know, they have an extra account uh, manager, what we call our ETAMs. Um, so where there's that automated process there, but for both CSM and IH assignment, um, the procedure through our enablement documentation that our AEs use as their glossary for like, hey, once I like lock down a deal, this is, these are the next steps. Um, they generally send a request with all of the pertinent um, information around ARR, size of customer, opportunity to land and expand, or you know other qualifying um, data points, and request through leadership for that CSM and IH um, assignment. So manual. <laughs> Awesome. Wonderful. Well, um, so we've talked a little bit about the when and how. The kind of top question in the Q&A right now is like, what is that handoff template? So um, what information do you think is really critical to include? What information is on that template for you? Um, Becca, do you want to start? 
Sure. I would love to. It's one of my favorite ones. It's all <laughs> about the customer at the end of the day. Uh, so for us, it's really, why are they, why did they decide to purchase Level Jump? What are their key priorities? What are their intended launch dates? What are we trying to move the needle on? So it's really all about setting up expectations for success and all that information that's uncovered from there. So the biggest thing, and this also goes back to how somebody gets assigned an account is we really work with our customers based on speed to launch that they're looking for. Our CSMs, we don't have we we don't have an implementation team. Our CS team works expansions and renewals as well and manages the accounts. So for them, for us, it's really what information do we need that we can come into this kickoff call ready with understanding their priorities, timelines, expected launch dates, and these things are all easily written down and recorded and can be pulled in and how, you know, through our catalyst template that feeds in from Salesforce. But a big piece for us is also prospect sentiment. And it's things that you can't just write down. And for us, our customers truly are our partners. So it's also understanding personalities and, and people. So it's so much more than great. We just closed this company. It's more who are these people that we're championing behind? So um, measurements for success, supporting resources we're going to need for them, prospect sentiment um, are just a few of the of the key things, along with the typical timelines and launch dates, things like that. Awesome, uh, Veronica. What about you? What if what if that is the same? What does Red Canary do differently from that? Yeah, um, Becca covered a lot of valuable points. I think the only items I would add is, um, you know, we have a fairly, internally, we have a fairly robust um, checklist from um, sales to um, CS handoff that includes just a reminder around, you know, uh, transition roles and responsibilities that lays it out fairly clear. AE does this, CSM does that, IH, ETAM, et cetera, so that everyone's literally on the same page. Um, then, you know, our transition questions sort of, you know, it, you, you think of like, you know, the high level, like contacts, the technical components to that particular customer environment, expectations, contract. And it's like during this time where you can speak to the sentiment components, you know, like, you know, this tends to be a fairly like, you know, I'm in security. Most of our customers are, are fairly quiet. So um, sometimes discussions are had on how to elicit engagement during um, some of our calls. And, um, you know, other other questions for the other customer facing um, stakeholders uh, for like for instance um, tech stack you know that's fairly important for our incident handling and our ETAM um, teams uh, persona like there's only so many personas in the security <laughs> industry so if you have that like fine tune. Um, then you know you have a good idea of like CSM and sales have a pretty good idea of like you know how to engage with this um, customer. Awesome, Stacy. What about at Catalyst? Yeah, so I think we've got a, a similar ish process to Becca. So our um, our template is split up into four parts: it's contract, uh, evaluation team, pre Catalyst, and implementation details. So Everything from contract automatically pulls from Salesforce. So like I don't have to do anything with that as a seller. I've already provided that. Uh, most of the um, evaluation team also automatically gets pulled from Salesforce. That's where to Becca's point, the, the softer side of things come in. And I think those are those things that knowing I'm handing it off to a specific person, like we care so much about our customers. It's like, I can think back and remember that like when I sold to Becca, I wrote like, she lives in Toronto. She's really good friends with Sid, our head of customer success. Like if I would be still selling to her, I would write down, she just shared, she just got a new cat. Like sharing some of that stuff or like Karen has a dog laying behind her. Great, a good <laughs> gift would be a bark box at some point. Like putting that type mm -hmm. of stuff is like, I think the, the softer side of stuff. And then we also have very specific questions in terms of pre-catalyst and implementation. So are there any red flags? Why did they buy Catalyst? What are they looking to achieve? Um, 
I mentioned that uh, as one of the kind of original folks on the sales team here at Catalyst, I really worked closely with our implementation team to understand what are the right questions and how can we make it very specific? Because I've been at Catalyst a long time. We're growing very quickly. So when someone new joins on the sales team, they should be able to open that template and very quickly fill it out as well. They shouldn't feel confused. They shouldn't feel like, oh, this is tribal knowledge and I'm not sure what to, to write here. And so I think we've really come a long way in terms of like having very clear kind of buckets, a very clear outline and making it very clear. Like if the question is what does success look like for this customer? If you're a new seller, you literally might not really know how to answer that. So actually having examples to help guide someone um, is, is kind of what we've, we've really put a lot of time into like perfecting that template. Um, and I think going back to a little bit of this, like how do you get sellers to, to fill it out and, and put good information I think of this as when we really worked on this template, it was helpful to me as a seller. I became better at selling Catalyst because I really knew this is what success looks like. Here is what gotchas mm -hmm. might be. I could be more upfront about those. I could ask the right discovery questions. Um, and I think that's, that's probably true for everybody who's on the, the sales team at Catalyst. Like that was like a win for us to be able to like get those things that we're always kind of asking from, from CS. Yeah. Um, there is a question, Stacey, can you repeat those four sections one more time? Oh yeah, for sure. So it's contract details, evaluation team, pre-catalyst and implementation details. Also, if anyone just wants to see our template, literally just message me on LinkedIn. I'll just like, send you a screenshot and you can see. Um, pre-catalyst, someone just asked that. Pre-catalyst is essentially like, what were they doing before? Mm -hmm. So there's automatically fields will populate with some things from their tech stack. Um, Catalyst is a CS platform. So I'm going to be answering questions about how are they managing renewals? How are they managing customer onboardings? How are they, what are their life cycle stages? How is health calculated? Some of those types of things. Yeah, awesome. Um, we have a couple of, of related questions that I wanna make sure we get to. The first one um, on this topic is the kind of shared checklists, onboarding steps, where do those live and do you automate kind of tasks and reminders around them to make sure that those timelines are staying on track? Um, Veronica, where do those live for you? Um, they live in uh, churn zero. So we, we do have automate um, playbooks and um, steps in place for all aspects of onboarding. So you'll get a reminder or task. Um, on, you know, where you should be approximately like with the onboarding process. So it's fairly clearly laid out there. Yeah. Right. And Stacey, I imagine those live in Catalyst for you, right? Yep. <laughs> Indeed they do. Um, yeah. I think that what is most helpful is the visibility like in the dashboard. Cause I think there's like the component of like checklists and tasks, yeah. like that's so much less applicable for me as a seller. It's like, we've gotten to the point where like, do your handoff, introduce the customer. That's basically all I have to do at this point. Um, so we have got the, the playbooks built out for the implementation team, but just having the visibility and knowing that what I'm looking at in Salesforce exactly matches what I could go and see in Catalyst or what our implementation and success mm -hmm. team are seeing in Catalyst, I think makes it very clear in terms of here's what, what I need to do to mm -hmm. kind of officially hand this over. Yeah. And Becca, do those kind of checklists and things live in Catalyst for you as well? Yes, they do. So once that handoff happens, um, we move that customer into a seller. We have different life cycle stages set up in Catalyst that then triggers responsibilities from the CSM to continue from that point on, having all the information they need, everything that's needed for our kickoff call and our install calls are already pre-populated and set up. And we always have sales join for the kickoff call with the customer. So that's like the final handoff has occurred. They've seen the team come together and there's no gaps um, whatsoever in data because everything is, was either in Salesforce fields brought into Catalyst or fields that we just built for uh, Catalyst specific that sales don't need to see inside of Salesforce, but it's, it's important for the CS to see them. Um, and then the sales team is tagged and updated on when that kickoff call is going to happen. So they're aware of uh, just coming on the call and joining and really bridging that relationship together for the customer to see as well. Awesome. And what did you do? Because it sounds like all of our panelists are using customer success software. Um, what did you do before Catalyst? Great question. 
So Level Jump's built on Salesforce. So we were just, we are, we're your Salesforce shop. Um, so we were using everything Salesforce. Um, the issue with that became a lot of Salesforce just reports of the kickoff, or we would have, we had the kickoff call deck ready that the CSM used to meet with the seller before because notes and things weren't being filled in properly, not, not, not filled properly in Salesforce, but there wasn't enough pertinent info in Salesforce that we still needed to meet with the seller to understand, okay, the, what we heard, the red flags, where were they before the deadlines? So we used to do, we used to have meetings pre kickoff and install. So it was much more manual. And now if we decide to meet with the seller before the customer, that's just because our, our team loves each other. And we're close. And we want to chat about it, but it's not required. So before with Salesforce info, move then into a deck and then sales was responsible for filling out a certain slide and the CSM to verify that information, prepare their part of the deck. And then this was all streamlined okay. once uh, we brought Catalyst in. Yeah, which I think this is a good segue to our next topic, which is what are some common handoff challenges that you've seen? Obviously, with the example you just gave of having everything in Salesforce, you, you had some that you wanted to fix. Um, uh, Veronica, let's start with you this time. What are some kind of common handoff challenges you've run into? Are there any fixes you've been able to implement to those? Yeah, so I think the first thing that comes to mind is um, gaps or insufficient knowledge transfer, and it happens, right? So each AE um, might, or our sales team might have a different style, um, and uh, really the challenge with that is that, you know, that really interrupts the, the customer journey, right? So in that like behind the scenes, like transfer, there's just a lot more with when CS, so when you think about my perspective with the CS or us, like our team sort of trying to glean this information from the customer, customer perspective, the sales team just asked me that, why am I having to repeat myself? So there's that like impact of, you know, the impression of like not a fluid process from the customer perspective. So I would say like insufficient, like data um, or knowledge chance transfer gaps as being a, a really big challenge. So, you know, utilizing customer success software is super helpful, especially, you know, if you have Salesforce at your organization and something that automatically like populates that as like a, a, a frame of reference for like, you know, different like teams is, is always going to help um, streamline, um, you know, the communications of and transfer of information back and forth. Uh, another item that is sort of a subtle nuance, but challenge I've, I've noticed is uh, competing objectives. So we've got two separate teams. You have sales and customer success. When you think about sales, you know, there might be a, a shorter like timeline there with, you know, customer um, interaction. And then you have your CS team, which is really focused on the long-term renewal, like land and expand um, aspect of the relationship. So um, what I've seen work, you know, for organizations and having these two organizations continue with a uh, good collaboration and, you know, um, partnership in their relationship with our customers and getting those expansions and upsells is, um, you know, compensation for like both parties for that expansion and upsell. Um, what I've seen less is, you know, the renewal component, but um, with that, just clear lines that are defined around some of the deta detail administrative items. So with CS, they'll own those expansion up and upsells, but both the um, AE and CSM will be compensated for, you know, when that closes. And those are just uh, a couple of items. Awesome. Um, Stacey, what about you? How, um, what handoff challenges have you seen that you have tried to solve, what kind of fixes have you put in place? Yeah, I think that the two challenges that I've seen the most are a misalignment between what information is being captured, what information is expected to be captured and what information is actually being used. Um, and then just like the, the challenge of like, what is the lift for an AE or a, an implementation manager when it comes to doing the actual handoff? So I think from a, a misalignment perspective, we've, 
we've like lived through this at Catalyst, right? Like we, we've come full circle on me closing and then losing some customers. And then when you hear, oh, well, we didn't ask this question of them up front, or they were a bad fit or they bought for the wrong reasons. That is a really great way to put an AE on the spot and immediately be like, whoa, hold up. What, what do you mean we didn't ask the right questions? Like I did what I thought I, like I, I did my best. I thought <laughs> they, they signed, right? Like we got him all the way there. And so I think that has been really helpful to have, like we had literally, it was kind of a, a come to Jesus, bury your heart out moment between CS implementation and sales of like, what do you guys really need to know to, to be set up for success? Because mm -hmm. we are so happy to ask those questions. You just have to tell us. And then you also have to like own up to the fact that if we give you that, like we gave you what you asked for. Mm -hmm. So then you, you, you can't come back and say, you asked the wrong things. And I think the way we've really solved for that is by having the, the template that was built by sales and implementation together. So this wasn't something that one team said, here's what you can have, or here's what we're asking of you. It was very collaborative in nature. And because it's a template, whether you've been at Catalyst from the beginning or whether you've just joined, you can immediately see here is what I'm going to be expected to share when this gets handed over. And what I've seen as like an actual outcome of that is I get asked very few questions by our implementation team post launch uh, or post kickoff, sorry. And that's pretty rare because I feel like it's constantly a churn of like being pulled back in when you close the deal. And that's when an AE is going to start to give you less and less <laughs> help, right? Of like, oh, I closed that. Like I'm, I'm done with it. But if I didn't give you the information you needed, um, then of course I have to come back. And so I think for me specifically, I've noticed like I don't get asked many questions by our implementation team once the deal is closed. And I think that really speaks to, we've gotten to a really good point in terms of what do I need to give you and what are you going to actually do with it? Um, and with that to the, the second challenge I shared, like what is the lift? I shared this at the, the top of the call, but we've gotten to the point where we don't need to do handoffs anymore. Um, we actually, the AEs don't even attend the, the kickoff, which was a, something I realized we're not being very clear about with our customers. A new customer emailed me the other week and they were like, we missed you on the kickoff, but it felt like you were there because we already, like everything you had shared, they knew about already. And I think, well, we need to be clear about, hey, we won't be there. This is goodbye. I think it really spoke to like, we have figured this out. Like we've really gotten to a good point of, I didn't need to be there. They were able to know everything they needed to know. And it's not something that is uh, taking a ton of time for me at this point as an AE. Yeah, um, that actually relates to one of the questions in the QA, which is how do you ensure in, in sales that you're setting expectations on what the kickoff call and onboarding process will look like? So it sounds like maybe one of the, one of the things that didn't happen is I won't be there, but how do you <laughs> approach that? Yeah, so we have, uh, a, a, everyone on the sales team has access to a deck that very clearly outlines, this is what implementation of Catalyst looks like. Here's who needs to be involved. Here's the level of effort. Here's what will happen and when. Um, going back to kind of the, the segmented, segmented approach for SMB and mid-market customers, AEs present that deck on their own. For enterprise and strategic deals, that's when we go into Catalyst, we see who the IM is on this deal, and we loop them into that conversation because a higher level of scoping and planning needs to come into play for a, a larger customer success team that we would be selling to. So uh, having just kind of the, having, I think, the resources and similar to the template, just having that open line of communication of, we recently went through this, I'm, I was getting questions that aren't answered in the deck and I really wasn't sure how to answer them. So being able to share that internally and say, hey, I think we need to tweak this slide. It worked six months ago. It's not really working the same way anymore. We're selling into larger and larger teams. They're asking different types of questions. Let's change this collateral. So um, yeah, yeah, hopefully that answers it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Becca, what about you? What kinds of handoff challenges have you seen? What kinds of fixes have you implemented? Yeah. So. And often challenge that came up that we really worked on rectifying was it's one thing to know when a, when a deal is a, the attended close date. But one thing that we were, we were noticing was intended close date was very different than when the customer expected to launch. So if we knew there was a tighter timeline on 
a close date that came out of nowhere or a longer off close date. It's not really the close date that matters. It actually matters is your intended launch date because that empowers the CSM to really understand that the deal may close quick, but they actually know the launch. So for, for us on the, on the op record, it's not just about here's the expected close date, here's the report, here's the expected CSM, fill out the template and all of that. It, the launch date was the key thing that solved that, that went back to you know the overarching thing, which is you always want to improve sales forecasting and you always want to ensure that you're forecasting so up to speed. So understanding the close date in terms of the prospect intended launch date helps to really create mutual accountability of the seller hitting that close date and the CSM knowing their responsibilities of when the launch should actually happen. Um, I think another challenge, um, Veronica, it's, it's similar to yours too, is um, really having SLAs in place for different types of deals being closed. For example, if there's a pilot, have, there's you're going to have um, different, faster timelines and outcomes that need to be achieved for a pilot to be able to move to a fully closed deal as opposed to a deal fully being closed. The CSM takes it from there. And really for us, once we figured out, okay, if a pilot takes place, here's a completely different flow that we take that's going to be similar information, but faster speed and the sales and CSM working together on it because they're both going to be comped on it really helped to absolve that challenge because it truly then is a team effort if it's a deal like a pilot or something went off like that um those would be pretty much the two but that the launch date is so key not just the close date and that really is that really is that bridge um and that trust between the csm and the sale um, and, the, and the seller and really ensuring that we can be there for that customer um to get them going awesome awesome um, we have some more questions coming in in the Q&A, but I want to make sure we get to our last topic as well. Um, so let's jump over to when and how should you engage technology to streamline the processes we've been talking about? This has kind of been threaded through uh, what we've been saying up to this point. Um, but Stacey, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think based on what I've what I've shared, you can probably guess always and as soon as possible. Um, I think someone asked a question in the, the chat earlier, like, are you guys storing this stuff in a Google Drive? Like, yes, that's technology, but I think you you lose the like, is someone going to continue to reference this? Have you do you have any automation around when is this being completed? Who is it going to? Um, so I think as soon as you can. I think it all goes back to the alignment, right? Of like, when do I need this information and what am I going to do with it? Making sure that that doesn't live on the piles of paper that I take my notes at for calls <laughs> <laughs> and that it gets into Salesforce at the right time and goes to the right people. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, the sooner the better. Yeah. Becca, how did, how did you know it was time to shift to um, technology enabled solutions? When, when we really needed to, we knew and understood our customer journey. And really for us, it was bridging the gap between our sales team and CS team have always worked so closely together. And as our team continued to grow and our customer base continued to grow is technology is great once you actually have found out what's not working and what's working because you can implement something and it's still not going to work. So it was really through data that helped us decide to move the way to bring in a catalyst that it's not just regurgitating what Salesforce is already giving us. It's giving us the whole picture from the customer um, landscape. And so for us, it came down to technology in terms of everything in one spot for the CSM, everything in sales is still in the same spot for them, except now they were introduced into this tool where, where they now have full visibility and the teams can work together and not cloud up the account and opportunity uh, levels inside of, inside of Salesforce. So that's when we, we always use technology, but I think everyone's always rushing for this tool can fix this, this tool can fix that. The biggest thing for us was how can this tool improve what we're already doing? How can it help not only just automate, but how can it 
help even our customers and help us internally streamline. Um, and that's when we really thought about what technology can best help us with that. Awesome. Uh, Veronica, what about at Red Canary? How do you think about technology enabling this? Yeah, so in this from similar sentiment to both um, Stacy and Becca, like as soon as possible. I mean, when I joined uh, Red Canary, we had, you know, I mentioned two CSMs and um, once my cohort joined, that brought us up to five and all of the information was contained in those two like CSMs, like trying to extract that information and the processes around that. There, the pain point was, like we hit a pain point where we needed to extract that information so that we can continue to grow. And um, I think if you were to associate like a number, um, you know, from what I've seen is, you know, as soon as you have two CSMs and up to a few like hundred like customers, it's, it's, it's time. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, your, your team is, is struggling where there's just siloed information and, you know, like a heavy use of maybe like Google Docs and, and manual processes where you can really leverage um, technology to help your like uh, organizations just excel with, you know, not having to think about the small stuff and like repetitive work of like gathering or gleaning um, like transfer, like information regarding customer accounts and sentiment and just having like what it sounds like with Catalyst, that dashboard that's easily, that easily provides you that information on like, I'm looking at so-and-so customer, I have all the facts I need to grab like a quick snapshot of what is pertinent and, infor and like informative so that I can just continue to move on and yeah, keep with, keep on going. Yeah, awesome. So um, I want to shift now to answer because we've we've had some questions pile up in the QA. Um, mm -hmm. One is, uh, I'm not sure length of implementation process. So um, if you have a longer implementation period, so you have a three to four month kind of implementation dedicated time frame. When do you introduce the CSM is essentially the question. Does it make sense to pull them in earlier so they're at least introduced or do they not get introduced until the end of the implementation period? Um, Stacey, I think Catalyst implementation period is a little bit shorter than that, but maybe you have, have a thought there. Yeah, I think we've gone back and forth with this at Catalyst and we've gone back and forth truly as a, uh, just because of capacity and number of people on the team. So in the beginning days, it was like, yes, meet everybody. This is great. And then slowly as like the customer count grows faster than the, the team can keep up, then we, we scaled that back and CSMs were not coming to uh, the, the kickoff session. I think we've gotten to a point now where we've realized, I think there's a lot of value in at least bringing that person to the initial kickoff. So having the CSM there so that you can start to build that relationship and then thinking about, is there maybe one or two other touch points that it makes sense to bring the CSM? So is there a particularly strategic conversation? Is there a session where it would behoove both the, the new customer and the CSM to be a part of that active engagement versus like just reading notes and catalysts later um, is kind of what we've found there. I think what it goes back to is like thinking about what would be the value from the CSM to attending or being along for the ride in the implementation? Are they going to get something out of being a part of that that would help them be a better CSM or drive customer retention or expansion, depending on what their um, kind of prerogative is to determine if someone should, should be along for the ride? I'm seeing nodding. Uh, Veronica, is that, uh, think, when did the CSMs get involved for you? Right. So I know um, Stacy had mentioned this earlier around, you know, segmentation with your customers. So at Red Canary, oftentimes the CSM is fairly involved to the final stages of a POC um, with our enterprise customers and our strategic customers. Less so with SMB, um, some mid-market, if, you know, we know there's like opportunity for expansion there, but enlisting the CSM, ETAM, and IH like early, especially when there's been communication from the customer interest of like, 
you know, we we sign with you, where do we go and what does that look like? Like those seem like the best opportunities to um, bring in the post sales account like management team to help further take that deal across the line. Yeah, and so you're introducing the CSM before the deal closes for enterprise and strategic and not for SMB and mid-market. Um, Becca, how do you handle that? Do you yeah, do something similar? Point. Uh, a little different. So it depends if it's a POC or enterprise mid-market SMB, if they have additional questions and further clarification or any deeper dives, I'm typically the person that's brought in on the team and the role that I'm in. But regardless is when we know the deal is closing, our sales team is our sellers are actually the one that does the introdu introduction, introducing them to the CSM they will be working with a background about them, why they're a great fit and all of that. So they're not necessarily brought in on calls. I'm typically there and brought in for more of the calls, asking any questions, the process of what it looks like once you are to sign up as a level jump customer. And then once they do, they're formally introduced to them by the seller through an email. And like Stacey said, those fun facts about, about, the CSM and the prospect are all brought into that welcome email and then the CSM takes it over from there. So we do it as slightly, slightly different, but still that, still that really personal feeling of it's like, it's not just about the seller closing goodbye. It's, it's, it's just welcoming a new team member um, to their roster. Yeah. Um, there are actually Becca, a couple of questions that I think related to your comment earlier about being really clear about the launch date. Um, and they're around, essentially, does CS ever start work before the deal closes in order to hit that launch date? And what happens if the close date kind of pushes? Great question. Um, sometimes, yes, we do. Uh, we want our customers to be successful. And it also depends on why the deal is stalled. If it's something to do with like legal or procurement and something being held up and we know it's going through, we want, we, we're going to get that work done. If there's other situations and circumstances that come up, we may end up speaking, re rediscussing those intended launch dates with the prospect, depending on the situation. But if we know it's if 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 it's something small and we know it's going to be going over the line, and this launch date is so important, um, our CS team will start work behind the scenes. Circumstantial. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, well, we've had so many great questions. Uh, I apologize, but we're not going to be able to get to all of them because we are down to our last couple of minutes. Would like to end with each of you just giving us your kind of tweet length takeaway. What's something you learned from the conversation today? Um, Veronica, you want to go first? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think a big takeaway that I learned here is that, you know, data informed success, right? So yeah, data informed success with sales to CS handoff. So being able to knowledge share with different organizations and glean what may work or may not work for your organization will, you know, hopefully equal um, successful outcomes with your um, company. Awesome. Stacey, what's your takeaway? Mine's uh, very tactical, but uh, sales should be capturing the expected launch date. Uh, we do not capture that as a field in uh, Salesforce today. So I will be taking that back to the team. I think that would be incredibly helpful for us to do. So thanks, Becca. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and Becca. <laughs> yeah. Um, mine are sales and CS are one team and there's really one bridge. And they start at the bridge together. And at the end is a really successful customer. And both sides need to be mutually accountable to each other and in it and in it together. And the biggest thing is don't overburden what you don't have to overburden to the seller. Um, and really that relationship is just so strong and what makes it so successful. It's one bridge, one team. Awesome. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who attended. We loved having you here. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions. Uh, thank you to our wonderful sponsor, Catalyst. Uh, they're doing great things. Be sure to check them out. Uh, and thank you to Veronica and Becca and Stacey for providing this great content. 
Um, recordings and key takeaways will be available on the MFP site shortly. Uh, don't forget to check out upcoming events and uh, stay safe and we will see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.